the last battle. This is chapter two, the rashness of the king. And it's the king, the rashness of the king. About three weeks later, the last of the kings of Narnia sat under the great oak which grew beside the door of his little hunting lodge where he had stayed. He often stayed for ten days or so in the pleasant spring weather. It was a low, thatched building not far from the eastern end of the Lantern Waste and some way above the meeting of the two rivers. He loved to live there simply and at ease, away from the state and pomp of Caer Paravel, the royal city. His name was King Tyrion, and he was between twenty and twenty-five years old. His shoulders were already broad and strong, and his limbs full of hard muscle. Uh, but his beard was still scanty. He had blue eyes and a fearlessly honest face. There was no one with him that spring morning except his dearest friend, Jewel the Unicorn. They loved each other like brothers, and each had saved the other's life in the wars. The lordly beast stood close beside the king's chair, with its neck bent round, polishing its blue horn against the creamy whiteness of its flank. "'I cannot say it set myself to any work or sport today, Jewel,' said the king. "'I can think of nothing but this wonderful news. Think you we shall hear more than today?' They are the most wonderful tidings ever heard in our days, or our father's or our grandfather's days, sire, said Jewel, if they are true. How can they choose but be true, said the king? It is more than a week ago than the first birds came flying over us, saying, Aslan is here, Aslan has come to Narnia again. And after that it was the squirrels, and they had not seen him. But they said it was certain he was in the woods. Then came the stag, he said he had seen him with his own eyes a great way off, by moonlight in lantern waste. Then came the dark man with the beard, the merchant from Kellerman. The Kellermans care nothing for Aslan as we do, but the man spoke of it as a thing beyond doubt, and there was the badger last night. He too had seen Aslan. Indeed, sire, entered Jewel, I believe it all. If I, if I seem not to, it is only that my joy is too great to let my belief settle itself. It is almost too beautiful to believe. Yes, said the king with his great sigh, almost a shiver of delight. It is beyond all that I ever ho hoped for in all my life. Listen, said Jewel, putting his head on one side and cocking his ear ears forward. What is it? asked the king. Hoofs, sire, said Jewel, a galloping horse, a very heavy horse. It must be one of the centaurs, and look, there he is. A great golden beard centaur with man's sweat on his forehead and a horse's sweat on his chestnut flanks dashed up to the king, stopped and bowed low. Hail, king, it cried in a loud voice as deep as a bull's. Ho there, said the king, looking over his shoulder towards the door of the hunting lodge. A bowl of wine for the noble centaur. Welcome, Runewit. When you have found your breath, you shall tell us your errand. A page came out of the house carrying a great wooden bowl. Curiously carved and handed it to the centaur. The centaur raised the bowl and said, I drink first to Aslan and Truth, sire, and secondly to your majesty. He finished the wine, another enough for six strong men, at one draught and handed the empty bowl back to the page. Now, Runewit, said the king, do you bring up more news of Aslan? Runewit looked very grave, frowning a little. Sire, he said, you know how long I have lived and studied the stars, for we centaurs live longer than you men, and even longer than your kind, unicorn. Never in all my days have I seen such terrible things written in the skies as there have been nightly since this year began. The stars say nothing of the coming of Aslan, nor of peace, nor of joy. I know by my art that there have not been such disastrous conjunctions of the planets for five hundred years. It was already in my mind to come and warn your majesty that some great evil hangs over Narnia, but last night the rumor reached me that Aslan is abroad in Narnia. Sire, do not believe this tale. It cannot be. The stars never lie, but men and beasts do. If Aslan were really coming to Narnia, the sky would have foretold it. If he were really come, all the most gracious stars would be assembled in his honor. It is all a lie. A lie, said the king fiercely. What creature in Narnia or all the world would dare to lie on such a matter? Without knowing it, he laid his hand on his sword hilt. That I know not, Lord King, said the centaur. But I know there are liars on earth. There are none among the stars. I wonder, 
said Jewel, whether Aslan might not come, though all the stars foretold otherwise. He is not the slave of the stars, but their maker. Is it not said that all, in all those told old stories that he is not a tame lion? Well said, well said, Jewel, cried the king. Those who are, those are the very words, not a tame lion. It comes in many tales. Runewood had just raised his hand and, his, and was leaning forward to say something very earnestly to the king when all three of them turned their heads to listen to a wailing sound that was quickly drawing near. The wood was so thick to the west of them that they could not see the newcomer yet, but they could soon hear the words, Whoa, 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 called the voice. Whoa for my brothers and sisters. Whoa for the holy trees. The woods are laid waste. The axe is loosed against us. We are being failed. Great trees are falling, falling, falling. With that last falling, the speaker came in sight. She was like a woman, but too, so tall that her head was on, le on a level with the centaurs. Yet she was like a tree, too. It is hard to explain if you have never seen a dryad, but quite unmistakable once you have. Something different in the color, the voice, and the hair. King Tyrion and the two beasts knew at once that she was the nymph of the beech tree. Justice, Lord King, she cried. Come to our aid. Protect your people. They are felling us in lantern waste. Forty great trunks of my brothers and sisters are already on the ground. What, lady? Felling lantern waste, murdering the killing, the talking trees, cried the king, leaping to his feet and drawing his sword. How dare they, and who dares it? Now, by the mane of Aslan, ah, gasped the dryad, shuddering as if in pain, shuddering time after time as if under repeated blows. Then all at once she fell sideways, and suddenly as if both her feet had been cut from under her. For a second they saw her lying dead on the grass, and then she vanished. They knew what had happened. Her tree, miles away, had been cut down. For a moment the king's grief and anger were so great that he could not speak. Then he said, Come, friends, we must go up river and find the villains who have done this with all the speed we can. I will leave not one of them alive. Sire, with a good will, said Jewel. But Rumit said, Sire, be wary, even in your just wrath. There are strange doings on foot. If there should be rebels in arms further up the valley, we three are too few to meet them. If it would please you to wait while... I will not wait the tenth part of a second, said the king, but while the jewel... But while Jewel and I go forward, to do you gallop as hard as you can may to care Paravel. Here is my ring for your token. Get me a score of men-at-arms, all well-mounted, and a score of talking dogs, and ten dwarfs, let them all be fell archers, and a leopard or so, and Stonefoot the giant, bring all of these after us as quickly as can be. With a good will, sire, said Runebit, and at once he turned and galloped eastward down the valley. The king strode on at a great pace, sometimes muttering to himself, and sometimes clenching his fist Jewel walked beside him, saying nothing, so there was no sound between them but the faint jingle of a rich gold chain that hung around the unicorn's neck and the noise of two feet and four hooves. They soon reached the river and turned up to, to it, up it, where there was a grassy road. They had the water on their left and the force on their right. Soon after that, they came to the place where the ground grew rougher and thick wood came down to the water's edge. The road where... What, what there was of it now ran on the south, southern bank, and they had to ford the river to reach it. It was up to Tyrion's armpit, but Jewel, who had four legs and was therefore steadier, kept on his right to break the force of the current, and Tyrion put his strong arm around the unicorn's strong neck, and they both got safely over. The king was still so angry that he hardly noticed the cold of the water, but, of course, he dried his sword very carefully on the shoulder of his cloak, which was the only part the only dry part on him as soon as they came to shore. They were now going westward with the river on their right side and lantern waste straight ahead of them. They had not gone more than a mile when they both stopped and both spoke at the same moment. The king said, What have we here? And Jewel said, Look, it is a raft, said the king Tyrion. And so it was, half a dozen splendid tree trunks, all newly cut and newly lopped of their branches, had been lashed together to make a raft and were gliding swiftly down to the river. On the front of the raft there was a water rat with a pole to steer it. Hey, what a rat! What are you about? cried the king. Taking logs down to sell to the Calamans, sire, said the rat, touching his ear as he might have touched his cap as if, if he had had one. 
Callum and Thunder Tyrion, what do you mean? Who gave order for these trees to be felled? The river flows so swiftly that at times, at that at, at the, that time of the year, that the raft had already glided past the king and jewel, but the water rat looked back over his shoulder and shouted, The lion's order, sire, Aslan himself. He added something more, but they couldn't hear it. The king and the unicorn stared at one another and both looked more frightened than they had ever in any battle, had ever been in any battle. Aslan, said the king at last, and in a very low voice, Aslan, could it be true? Could he be felling the holy trees and murdering the dryads? Unless the dryads have all done something dreadfully wrong, murmured Jewel. But selling them to the Calamans, said the king, is it possible? I don't know, said Jewel miserably. He's not a tame lion. Well, said the king at last, we must go on and take the adventure that comes to us. It is the only thing left for us to do, sire, said the unicorn. He did not see at the moment how foolish it was for two of them to go alone, nor did the king. They were too angry to think clearly, but much evil came of their rashness in the end. Suddenly the king leaned hard on his friend's neck and bowed his head. Jewel, he said, what lies before us? Horrible thoughts arise in my heart. If we had died before today, we should have been happy. Yes, said Jewel, we have lived, we have lived too long. The worst thing in the world has come upon us. They stood like that for a minute or two and then went on. Before long, they could hear the hack, hack, hack of axes falling on timber, though they could see nothing yet because there was a rise of the ground in front of them. When they had reached the top of it, they could see right into Lantern Waste itself, and the king's face turned white when he saw it. Right through the middle of that ancient forest, the forest where the trees of gold and of silver had once grown and were a child, where a child from our, our world had once planted the tree of protection, a broad lane had already been opened. It was a hideous lane, like a raw gash in the land, full of muddy ruts where felled trees had been dragged, ruddy, muddy ruts where felled trees had been dragged down to the river. There was a great crowd of people at work, and a cracking of whips and horses tugging and straining as they dragged the logs. The first thing that struck the king and the unicorn was that about... Half the people in the crowd were not talking beasts, but men. The next thing was that these men were not the fair-haired skinned, fair -haired men of Narnia. They were dark, bearded men from Calaman, that great and cruel country that lies beyond Archenland across the desert to the south. There was no reason, of course, why one should not meet a Calaman or two in Narnia, a merchant or an ambassador, for there was peace between Narnia and the Calaman. And Kellerman in those days, but Tyrion could not understand why there were so many of them. Now, why they were cutting down a Narnian forest. He grasped his sword tighter and rolled his cloak round his left arm. They came quickly down upon, among the men. Two Kellermans were driving a horse, which was harnessed to a log. Just as the king reached them, the log got stuck in a muddy, a bad, muddy place. Get on, son of sloth, pull, you lazy pig, cried the Kellermans, cracking their whips. The horse was already straining himself as hard as he could. His eyes were red, and he was covered with foam. Work, lazy brute, shouted one of the Calamans, and as he spoke, he struck the horse savagely with his whip. It was then that the really dreadful thing happened. Up till now, Tyrion had taken it for granted that the horses which the Calamans had driven were their own horses, dumb, witless animals like the horses of our own world, and though he hated to see even a dumb beast overdriven, he was, of course, thinking more about the murder of the trees. It had never crossed his mind that anyone would dare to harness one of the free talking horses of Narnia, much less to use a whip on it, but as that savage blow fell, the horse reared up and said, half screaming, "'Fool and tyrant, do you not see I am doing all I can?' When Tyrion knew that the horse was out of his own Narnians, was one of his own Narnians, there came over him and over Jewel such a rage that they did not know what they were doing. The king's sword went up and the unicorn uh, horn, unicorn's horn went down. They rushed forward together. The next moment, both the Calamans lay dead, the one beheaded by the Tyrian sword and the other gored through the heart by Jewel's horn. <sighs> oh, this looks like a bad, bad time. But there you go. The last battle. That was chapter two. Back with more later. Bye.